these are the top three things that I see in especially orthodontist business owners that are holding them back from growing their practices and having the balance, perfectionism, people pleasing, and low failure tolerance. The fastest way to success is actually through failure. Mm -hmm. The more action you take, even if it's wrong action, but you'll learn from it, the faster you will get from point A to point B. As a clinician, I cringe to hear that. So the faster you learn to make a mistake, it's a failure. Failure is just, you didn't get the outcome that you had planned for, that's it. We make failure this big, hairy thing that somehow it's uh, a reflection on us as a person. Dr. Jana, thanks so much for coming on the Grow Ortho podcast. Super excited to chat with you today. Me too. Thank you so much for having me, Luke. Absolutely. Give just a brief overview of who you are and what you do. So my name is Dr. Jana Konovalenko. I am a board certified orthodontist and I'm a certified life coach. I consider myself a peak performance coach for women dentists and I help them optimize their time you know, create the work-life balance so that they can have the incredible career as a dentist without sacrificing their life. We've both been on um, the the same show, Dental Marketer. That's what it was. So I was watching <laughs> a little bit of that and looking at the show notes and saw that you had listed Napoleon Hill, Dale Carnegie, um, Tony Robbins, so maybe yes. we could start there. How did you start to look into those names? I mean, some of those people are dead and have been dead for a long time. Um, yeah. And I have all their books. I've studied them extensively. Um, so I'm just curious where you started to hear those names and, and how that information and training kind of um, affected your life. Gosh, I don't even know how I heard and all those names. It just goes so far in my life. <laughs> I have been always interested in other people, mm. like what, what makes other people tick. I've always been interested in, I didn't know what it's called when I was a kid, but like the psychology of success, mm -hmm. right? I grew up in a family of high achievers and it was always instilled in me, success, success, get straight A's, be good, right? And that requires a lot of work, right? And so I uh, have no idea how, but I started stumbling on um, Tony Robbins, other motivational speakers. Then when internet was invented, because I am I go back in the day when internet was just invented mm -hmm. when I was a teenager. There was, I discovered such thing as YouTube and motivational videos and things like that. So I started just binge, watch, binge watching all that to stay motivated, to help me develop self-discipline and things like that. So I think that's how I um, just got in the world of personal development, mm -hmm. like from the very, very beginning. And then from there, I just found my first coach got certified and the rest is history. <laughs> That's a one minute version of it. You mentioned success. What does success mean to you? To me personally, success means balance in and achieving your goals. Mm. That's what it is. Meaning I love having goals. I love having things that I'm moving towards but never at the expense of my health or my happiness or my personal life. So having that balance of the two, when I feel like I am achieving what I set out to do mm -hmm. and knowing that I'm not killing myself over it, mm -hmm. that makes me feel pretty successful. <laughs> Have you ever been out of balance? Have I ever? Um, yeah, definitely. That's, that's how I found my first life coach okay. when I first... Uh, finished residency as an orthodontist back in 2016, I was working at a very fast paced practice, um, like 100 patients plus a day mm. practice. And it's not unusual for orthodontists. Um, and also I had to like manage the practice some and stuff like that. And yeah, I, I was out of balance. I was working crazy hours. I was still not very experienced in orthodontics, right? I just graduated. I didn't really have a mentor um, for the craft itself, for, for ortho. I did not have any coaches or mentors that would help me be more organized and manage my time well and set my priorities. 
better and things like that. So yeah, I was working crazy hours. I was dreaming about cases. <laughs> so I couldn't even relax at night. <laughs> I remember waking up and thinking, class two on the left, mm -hmm. 014 on the bottom, power chain. <laughs> I was like, what? I can't even relax. So yeah, I have definitely been out of balance. What do you think are some <laughs> of the the practical steps, maybe somebody even watching or listening is facing extreme burnout and maybe they're not quite ready to, to hire a coach and, you know, just getting some new patterns, some new habits moving. What are some of those things that, that you landed on? You know, the word burnout has been, has been throwing out, I think pretty casually mm -hmm. out there. And, um, the true burnout is not something that uh, like you can uh, get out of on your own or even with a coach. Mm. Like if you truly are burnout, it means you're non-functional. You like have extremely hard time getting out of bed. Mm -hmm. Like you have no desire to do anything. You know, you have very, very low energy. Like this is not something that you can do on your own and you definitely need help friends and family, and then probably therapy or even psychiatry sometimes, right? Mm -hmm. I think what people mean when they talk about burnout is the technical term is pre-burnout. Mm -hmm. Like you're basically getting a little roasty, yeah. <laughs> you're like getting a little overwhelmed or a lot overwhelmed. And you're like, oh my God, like this is a lot, like what's happening. I'm just so reactive. I'm putting up fires. I think that's what people mean when they're talking about overwhelmed. And it's funny that you said like, what are some practical steps that you can do if you're not ready to reach out to someone for help. And that is a big issue for many doctors mm -hmm. because we are conditioned to believe, conditioned to believe, meaning we just observe by osmosis this pattern of thinking that um, we should know how to handle everything mm. ourselves and we should just let things go and get over it and just get it done. Which makes sense in practice, right? Like you're the you're the doctor. Like every everybody goes to you for any any problem, right? But if you continue thinking this way, that's where you get stuck. That's where it's very hard to quote unquote get out of your own way. And that's where talking to someone might be very helpful. Um, but a lot of doctors don't because there's a lot of shame and stigma and guilt associated with that, which I don't even understand why. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you go to practice management consultants when you want to increase your revenue. Why not go to a performance coach to increase your performance? But so step number one would be understand that what you're going through is completely normal. And sharing even with your friends or colleagues that you're struggling is normal. Mm -hmm. Talking to a coach or hiring somebody is completely normal. Um, and what they will help you do is they will help you organize your time better, set goals, and help you uncover your own biases that has mm -hmm. led you to be where you're at. That's why when you say practical steps on your own, I mean, get a calendar, make a to-do list, prioritize things, easier said than done. Like lack of knowledge is not the problem. It's the implementation that's the mm -hmm. problem. And the reason why people don't implement is because of some biases that they have, which we're blind to. We can't see them. So there's we're not meant to do a lot of things on our own. There's a lot we can unpack there. Yes. Um, I yeah. was once, you know, in pre-burnout, and I'm so glad you said that because I do see this term thrown around all the time. You know, you hear, unfortunately, a lot more terms thrown around. I'm depressed and you know, I'm at mm -hmm. burnout and, you know, I even hear it from people in early twenties who have a good job and have a lot of things going for them. And it's like, really, are, are you burnout? Are you actually depressed? Yeah, and yeah. maybe some of them are, but I do think culture tells us and kind of programs us a little bit, uh, with social media and messaging. And maybe we're not those things. Maybe we just need some optimizations and looking at others, communicating with others, like you're saying, we hold all this stuff yeah. in and we're trained to and, and told, you know, maybe don't talk about it or don't talk about it openly or get feedback, you know, because feedback yeah. is huge. But 
some of the things that I found, because um, I got married, I started a business all at the same time, and I realized I was... Great idea. Yeah, I, I re- <laughs> realized what uh, debt was and, and how it really mm-hmm. shackled you. I was probably about $150,000 in debt, which isn't a ton if you're talking to an orthodontist. But for me and what I was earning oh. at the time, it was a lot. And some of the things that I prioritized uh, finally around 2018 was my health and Mm -hmm. um, enjoying time with my family and Mm -hmm. just simple things like getting outside and getting some sun and, you know, putting your toes in the sand and these small little things that really do start to create some momentum. You know, I mean, even when you look at foods, if your sugar intake and, you know, processed foods and all of these things, I didn't even have a baseline on my blood work. So yeah. for me, those were, were some simple things to kind of get some momentum. And then yeah. I hired a series of coaches that really helped me. And what I find so interesting with doctors, they're very smart people, you know, and they're, they're trained that maybe they should know everything. And I find that with more males, the ego is really high. So they they can't admit when they don't know everything. It's interesting within business, and this is really any small business, but specifically if we're talking about private practice, there's the doctor, and then typically there's a flat org chart of everybody else. And Mm -hmm. the practices that actually grow start to build leadership and a team that they can work with and communicate with and get feedback with to grow. And then it's not so overwhelming because when you have the opposite of, you know, the doctor and everybody else, the doctor's not just responsible for everything clinically. I mean, they're approving time off, they're running one-on-ones, they're running payroll. You know, if there's HR issues, they're having to look into that. And one person cannot do it all. I don't care how much of a high performer you are and how smart you are, it takes a team, you know? Totally, yeah. You know, that's something that I would encourage people to is like actually studying teams. And I like studying sports teams. You know, imagine if you took the quarterback out and like put him on the defense. It yeah, probably yeah, wouldn't work totally. too well. I don't know if that helps others. It certainly helped myself. I love the whole list of activities that you had listed. Mm-hmm. But what's always interesting to anybody in that similar situation or to a coach is what was that tipping point that made you take that first step? Pain. Because that's where people are. Yeah. Right. But you chose to think something about that pain that puts you on a track that served you, Mm -hmm. as we call it coaching. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of people are in pain go a different way. Mm -hmm. They start Mm self-medicating. You either try to escape it with other things. And that is what, when I say sometimes you really need a second set of eyes on that, Mm -hmm. is because what is that tipping point? That's a million dollar question. How do I get myself to get out of on the sun and and enjoy time with my family? Like, I know what I need to do, but I'm just on the hamster wheel constantly running here. Like, have to pedal, 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 Mm -hmm. (laughs) because like everything is just on fire, right? Like, how do you stop that? And for some people, I don't know what was your tipping point in that, but what you, what did you think about the amount of pain you got to that made you choose those um, activities that were helpful? That's where sometimes people need help with. Yeah. There is so much strategy out there. Like the lack of knowledge is not a problem. Mm-hmm. It's the actually doing it, the implementation. Something that I found interesting too with what you're saying is I think most people want to have impact and to have the most impact, you do have to get out of your own way and you do have to start trusting others and depending on others, empowering others. Cause yeah, yeah, again, we're, we're the smart ones, you know, but everybody has their own genius. And so how can we rely on others from coaches to team members, to spouses, because we just can't do it all. And the moment that I realized that. And also I had this vision of impact that I wanted to make Mm -hmm. and I knew to make it, I couldn't be in pain and I couldn't feel that way because I was in a state where I couldn't actually have real impact. It was very limited. 
Yeah. So for me, that was, that was kind of it, seeing the, the pleasure of impact and what my life could be and moving away from the pain. That was your tipping point. I, I often, this is where I teach my clients is any problem or any situation you're in, anything, I don't care if it's personal, I don't care if it's business, I don't care if it's revenue, I don't care if it's your assistants are not <laughs> listening to you. Any situation has two sides of it, two components. Mm. I call it math and I call it drama. They're lovingly. So if we are in a great state of mind, we're thinking super logically, the, there is just math of any problem, the steps to get out of it, right? Mm-hmm. But because of all these biases, all the drama that's going on in our head is why we're not tapping into the most logical solution, right? That's what coach helps you do. What, what do I mean by biases? You know, thoughts like, oh, I don't have time. Mm-hmm. I can't afford that. I don't know how to do it. I've never done that. I'm the one responsible. Money don't grow on trees. Like I, all these sentences seem like true. Like this is actual thing that's happening. But think about it. If you just logically, unemotionally thought, I don't have enough time in my week to do X, Y, Z. If you don't have like the emotional, like negative tint that comes with it, you would have solved for that problem. You're like, okay, I don't have enough time. Let's look at my calendar. What can I move? What can I say no to? What can I delegate? But that's not how most of us solve that problem, is it? Most of us go into the spin. That's where the drama comes in. And that's when such great advice out there from all the consultants and all the coaches is do this, buy this calendar, hire this person, delegate, create systems. And it's like all great. And then we're left with upkeep of that. And we don't really want to do that. Mm -hmm. Why is that? That's where I come in. The reason why we don't follow through on these things are our perfectionism or because we're people pleasing our team a little bit. Or number three is low failure tolerance. So these are the top three things that I see in especially orthodontist business owners that are holding them back from growing their practices and having the balance are three things, perfectionism, people pleasing, and low failure tolerance. Can we break each one of those down just a little bit? Yeah, totally. So here's, I see a very typical scenario. We go to dental school and it's so funny that in dental school somehow, I don't know how, but we just know that the goal is to own a practice. Like, I don't know who tells us that, (laughs) but you kind of know that like you arrive once you graduate and you own, Mm -hmm. like that's the goal. And so we get out of the practice and we're an associate and we're like, oh, I don't like this. I don't have control over that. And they are working me so hard and I'm not making as much. I need to own, I need to own. And some of us question that. They're like, especially women, we're like, I kind of want to have kids. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I can have a practice and I have a kid. And, you know, but most men are like, yeah, 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 let's buy. And so you buy a practice either from scratch, right? a startup or you uh, buy a goodwill from someone and you're like, great, let's go. You're so eager, but you don't know how to run it, right? You're like, I don't really know how to run it and let alone how to grow it. And the staff doesn't really listen to me and I don't know where to get patients from. So what do you do? The most logical thing is to take some practice management courses, right? So how many times have we bought a course and not finished it or not haven't done everything that they told us? So we're like, I don't have enough time. I need, what's the next most logical thing to do? We're going to hire a practice consultant, right? They're going to come in. They're going to tell us how to run processes that sound so amazing and organized. And they will even train staff for us because we're like, I don't want to really deal with that. Mm -hmm. You do it. You're better than that. And so the consultants might even train your team, your TC, your practice manager, and then they leave. And you're like... Oh, no, I have to manage that. I don't really want to do that. Mm -hmm. I don't really want to hold them accountable. So I'm just either going to do it myself and get burned out or I'm going to hire a manager. I'm going to outsource. Great. The manager comes in and either she's not great or she's great, but now she's running the practice. She's like, I'm the doctor. Or she's so great that she drives the staff away (laughs) because she's so strict. (laughs) Typical scenario happens to my clients all the time. And so, again, you as a doctor have to step in and do something, but you don't want to do it. Why is that? That's where coaching comes into place. You don't want to deal with 
these things because of perfectionism. You want everything smooth and perfect. And God forbid somebody doesn't perform the way you want, you take it so personally, right? Like it means something on you and it always goes to... I'm going to lose my practice. I'm going to lose my license. All this time and money are wasted. I didn't make my dad and mom proud and I'm not good enough as a person. So that's where perfectionism comes into place. People pleasing. In order for your team to run efficiently and smoothly, A, they need to know exactly what to do, clear job descriptions, but then you have to have meetings with them, help them redirect and hold them accountable if they still are not doing that. We as doctors don't want to hold anybody accountable. Because we want our team to like us. And we're very um, conflict averse. I hear that often from my clients. Unless you learn how to have difficult conversations with people and not make it mean anything about yourself as a person, because what happens often for doctors, doctor is our personality. It's like who we are. Mm -hmm. It's actually just our career. It's like not everything. (laughs) But separating the two is really tough for doctors, I've noticed. And so once you separate the two, it's going to be easier to have these conversations with people, understand that it's business, it's not personal, Mm -hmm. you're not running a sorority here, Mm -hmm. we have to have some sort of rules. Anybody who has kids, like they like routines, Mm -hmm. (laughs) follow through and you need to talk to them. And then the last piece, low failure tolerance, that has to do with the business part, right? So as an orthodontist business owner, you wear two hats, right? One is the orthodontist, the doctor. You have to do the work, straighten the teeth. Another one, you're a business owner. You're running a business, not a charity, right? You have to be a CEO of your business, which completely nobody teaches us in school at all. That's where we take classes and have these consultants come in. But the way the orthodontist thinks and the way the CEO thinks are two different mindsets, right? And so you have to separate these two a little bit and put different hats and learn different skills. Here's what I mean by that. As a doctor, you are, uh, you obviously want to do the best for your patients, right? You want to have the perfect outcome. You don't want to make mistakes. You don't want unhappy patients, but we're not perfect. So we are constantly learning Mm -hmm. from every case, but a lot of us take it very close to heart, anything that didn't go well, like we make it personal again about ourselves. And so we don't learn from our cases. Like what I mean by that is I see often orthodontists like not even looking back at their cases or at progress records or not scheduling time on their calendar to to make sure everything is done, is going on track. Or if it's not, that's okay. Let's reach out to communities, Facebook groups, mentors, and like, let's learn from this. We're kind of hiding a little bit from that because again, we want to be perfect. Mm-hmm. We're afraid of negative feedback. And if the case doesn't go well, we see it as failure and a failure is terrible. And we're just going to lose our license probably and have horrible reputation and It's going to be the end. (laughs) So we don't even learn from that. That's one part. As a business owner, the fastest way to success is actually through failure. Mm -hmm. The more action you take, even if it's wrong action, but you learn from it, the faster you will get from point A to point B. As a clinician, I cringe to hear that. (laughs) Because again, perfectionism, right? Like we don't want to make mistakes. Like, no, no, no right? We want everything to go smoothly and perfect. Obviously unrealistic. As a business owner, you learn on a pile of mistakes and failures. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but isn't that why I hire a business consultant? Sure, they have great advice, but nobody has walked in your shoes, Mm -hmm. in your exact practice, your exact path. Nobody. Nobody knows 100% what you need to do to get to your goals until have done it in your shoes, in your practice. So it's normal that some things are not going to work out. Mm-hmm. And it's okay. We just need to make sure that you're tracking what you're doing. And again, you're learning from it. So the faster you learn to make a mistake, it's a failure. Failure is just you didn't get the outcome that you had planned for. That's it. We make failure this big, hairy thing that somehow it's uh, a reflection on us as a person. Totally not true. As a business owner, you need to get used to moving past your failures, trying something else, and picking yourself back up and going. 
So that's why I see these three things, perfectionism, people pleasing, and low failure tolerance are standing in the way of business owners becoming successful. Mm -hmm. Some of the things I thought about, there's a old quote, it's not the strongest or the smartest, it's the most adaptable that survive and thrive. And, you know, the best business owners, like you said, they fail forward. They're not afraid to take action. They're decisive, but they learn from their mistakes. A lot of people don't learn from their mistakes. And I think that's what separates the great businesses from the businesses that do fail. And tons of small businesses Mm -hmm. fail. I think over 20 years, it's about 80%. Mm -hmm. So being adaptable, learning from your mistakes. And to do that, you can't take yourself too seriously. When you talk about the doctor and the stereotypes that we know about doctors, very smart, ego driven, um, you know, have to do everything. And I can relate. A lot of times you take yourself way too seriously. When you fail, most people don't remember it the next day, the next week. Mm -hmm. We beat ourselves up over and over again because we held ourselves to this insane bar of excellence. And it's just not possible to hit that mark all the time, you know? So not taking myself too seriously has really helped me in terms of just, if I fail, Hey, just keep going, you know? Yeah. Um, Yeah. And yeah, totally. I guess I would describe those things you mentioned. I don't know if you would. I'm curious your thoughts on this self-sabotage. In the context of low failure tolerance, is that what you're talking about? Well, with all those things, you talked about perfectionism, people pleasing, low failure tolerance. Um, I look at them as self-sabotage because a lot of times we want something. We want a goal. We want a certain business, a certain practice, a certain lifestyle. And we say we want those things. I talk to a lot of doctors who say they're in the right mindset, who say they're open to taking all the right steps. But when you look at what they actually do, they operate within the things that you just mentioned and more things Mm -hmm. as well. And they sabotage the whole process and they don't even realize it. It's almost like delusion to some Mm -hmm. degree. They say they want a totally different outcome, but to get a certain outcome, you have to do the things, you have to follow the path to get there, right? And if you're doing the complete opposite things, you're not in congruence. Yeah, 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 totally. I see what you're saying now. Yeah, I guess... I, I guess you can call it self sabotage for sure. I I just don't love the word. Yeah, I don't either. <laughs> it's like it sounds pretty bad. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It feels kind of icky for me, but I um yeah, I totally see what you're saying. I I call it having biases mm-hmm. that you don't see. Here's the thing. Actions create results, right? Like when you to do the thing, like you said, you know all the things to do to get to where you want to go. First problem is a lot of people don't have the clarity of what do they even want? Mm-hmm. <laughs> we live these sometimes reactive, especially when we get busy, we live these reactive lives where we really don't stop to think, what do I really want out of my life? We constantly feel behind. So we are just rushing to finish up the day and, and like look to the right, to the left, what our friends or colleagues are doing and make sure we're keeping up. But we don't consciously stop and decide what do I want? When do I want to retire? That's one of the things that I do with my clients is I say, do you know when you want to retire? Stops people in their tracks. They're like, what? Mm-hmm. I don't know. I like, I'm just trying to keep up here with deliveries for the dentist. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. I haven't thought about this. Like I, I have to figure out how I'm going to pay payroll, payroll this week. Mm-hmm. My assistant's just announced she's pregnant. Like they're just constantly in it. So they don't look at the big picture. Right. And Consciously deciding what do you want your life to look like, career and life wise, relationships, health, all of that helps you reverse engineer the result Mm -hmm. because then you know what actions you need to take to get there. So I think clarity is one of the biggest things why people don't hit their mark. They don't even know what what target is, what they're shooting for. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes they don't know it because they're busy to stop and consciously decide. Sometimes is because sadly we think that what we 
have this inkling inside of us, what we truly want, we think it's out of reach. Mm -hmm. We can't have it. I can't tell you how many times I coach women who are now practice or owners, they own a practice, and they tell me, I wish I had done that 10 years ago. Mm. I just thought that if I wanted to be a mom and have a practice, these two things cannot go hand in hand. And they spend years and years and years not pulling the trigger on either. And then at the end, not having the outcome that they wish they had. They either don't have children or they don't buy practice until later in life and they had wished they did. All because they didn't even think what they truly want is achievable Mm -hmm. or possible. A lot of the times we'll look to the right, to the left. Well, others don't have that. So then that's not possible for me. Mm -hmm. Says who? Yeah. (laughs) Right? So that's another point of uh, why people don't hit their goals or don't don't get to where they want to go. Another one is, let's say you're super clear on what you want and you had set these goals like your wildest dreams. You're like, nothing is impossible. I really want to have 12 kids and 17 offices and only work once a week. <laughs> right? And you're like, let me reverse engineer all that. Then what happens, you are going to come against your own limited thinking. Mm-hmm. You're going to come against your own brain. What do I mean by that? Our brains are actually in, evolved to be very negative. Mm-hmm. Again, it's kind of like, not like a, like an icky thing to say, oh, you're so negative. It's almost like... Find the problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's almost like an insult. Look, be more positive. In the reality, actually, the most evolved humans, the, the ones that survived from the cavemen, are negative ones. Negativity bias is our brain's way of keeping us alive, like constantly looking for danger and escaping it mm-hmm. or avoiding or fighting it, right? Fight or flight. So it's actually like from the evolutionary standpoint, it's very useful to be negative mm-hmm. because you will survive. Right now in our life of pretty much abundance, like we have fridges and cars and credit cards, right? We're not like running around anymore um, from the lion. This negative thinking is not serving us. Mm-hmm. It's just keeping us stuck in these survival loops, right? And that's what I call biases because they show up in like the smallest things, just like how I mentioned to you before. Let's say you have a goal to grow your practice and then the thought pops, ooh, but there's shortage of associates. Mm -hmm. Small little sentence, but you you believe it's true. Your brain, that's a negative thing to say, right? It's like a scarcity mentality Mm -hmm. if you want to go coach speak, right? I can't find an associate. It's hard to find associates or associates are hard to train. Mm -hmm. Like That thought, just negative thought pops in your hand because your brain is doing its normal job, healthy brain, supposed to be negative all the time. I can't compete with the DSOs who are hiring them so fast. Exactly. And then you're going to go and look for the evidence in life how you thought it's true. You're like, oh, DSOs are taking all the associates Mm -hmm. or... um, my friend down down the street here had a horrible experience with associates. Mm-hmm. So you're going to start accumulate this evidence for the limitations to create the life that you want. Mm-hmm. You are not on purpose self-sabotaging yourself. You just don't know how to become friends with your own brain mm-hmm. and help it work towards your goals, not against them. 100%. Google will tell you that 80% of all thoughts are negative. It may be even higher. Mm -hmm. I think what is so good to know and just gives us like a relief for everyone is that nothing has gone wrong Mm -hmm. if you wake up and you have the slur of negative thoughts. Mm -hmm. You don't have to fight them. You don't have to beat yourself up for that. Mm -hmm. Just drop the resistance. Mm -hmm. The resistance is what creates more of negative thoughts. Mm -hmm. Just realize that you are actually one of the evolved, the most evolved human and your brain is completely normal. It's just doing the thing. Right. When you approach it this way, like, uh, oh, I hear you brain. Okay. All right. I guess it's going to be another hard day. No problem. Just come on here for the yeah. right. The rest of your day is going to be so much easier. You're going to be so much more productive. You're just not going to make it a big deal out of these negative thoughts. And then you can better follow through on the actions that you know you need to take because you reverse engineered them to get to your goals. 
And I think that's where a coach comes in into place to help you normalize your experience and help you support in growing into, you know, growth mindset concept, help you grow into a more evolved, more positive, more conscious version of you. Yeah. I think that's the key distinction. Everybody thinks, oh, I just need to be more positive. I disagree. I think you need to be more conscious, more intentional about what you think and do. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's not going to feel great and that's okay. That's where self-discipline comes into place. Mm -hmm. Get clarity and be intentional. Do you know who Coach Prime is? Deion Sanders? Mm -hmm. Okay. You should Mm -hmm. look him up. You would love him. Uh, Mm -hmm. he's ex NFL player, extraordinaire, played both sides of the football, played baseball as well. And now he's a a coach, but he says, I never have a bad day. I may have a bad minute. I may have a bad Mm -hmm. couple of hours, but I set my own thermostat. So in his mind, he just tweaks the thermostat and sets it back. Yes. And some of this, I I really believe is Mm self-hypnosis because You have the ability to do that, like you're saying, just by what you're thinking and the story that you're playing in your head. And it's interesting, you, I'm not familiar with self-hypnosis at all. I am, you know, I'm very um, logical and numbers and all these things. And when I hear self-hypnosis, it sounds a little woo-woo to me, (laughs) which totally no offense to (laughs) anyone, but I'm very like evidence-based, scientific, and maybe there's evidence-based about hypnosis. I don't know. I don't know much about that. Again, I talk to a lot of people who come in, they're like, but how do I become more intentional? But how do I think better thoughts? Like that seems impossible. Like my brain is just bombarding me with all these negative thoughts. And what I want to offer people is you don't always have to like talk yourself into thinking something different. Mm -hmm. Like, like for example, you wake up and you're like, oh, my alarm didn't go well, didn't go off on time and I don't have lunch and I forgot about this meeting and I'm so puffy today and I don't have water and all these things, right? You don't have to be like, everything's great. Everything's great. I'm having a good day. You know, law of attraction. For sure. (laughs) Because that could be fake. They're not great. That could be fake. Yeah. Right. Right. Or like, oh my God, what's going on? Um, There's a good reason why the brain wants to be negative. Like what if somebody's going to jump out of an alley with a knife? You're like, What's up? Yeah, better be aware. <laughs> you want to help. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. You kind of want to be um, a little bit on your toes. What happens is typically it's not the super negative thoughts that are um, creating problem. It's these seemingly true thoughts. Like, I don't have enough time. I mean, it has like a negative flavor to it, but it's not terrible mm-hmm. thought to think. But where we get hosed is that we don't realize it's an optional thought. It just feels so true to us that my day is crazy. Mm -hmm. I have a hundred patients. It's going to be a crazy day. I am so tired of explaining CO extractions over and over (laughs) again. It's my sixth consult, right? We, We have these sentences that fly in our brain and we think that we're just observing the news. We're just telling the truth, the facts of it. And it's practically impossible to see them as completely optional sentences to think. That's why, again, going back to having a coach, having a very unbiased friend, journaling, I highly recommend having some practice where you taking these thoughts out of your brain and somewhere else and either very critically looking at them or having somebody else say, hey, you know that this there's a different way to look at it. This mm-hmm. is actually not true, true. So I think this is what would really help um, to change the, the whole trajectory of your day and of your month is if you see these sentences as really what they are, optional. Mm-hmm. One of my clients said this and I thought it was brilliant. She said, you know what? You really have to pay attention to what you're thinking because if you don't, you might believe it. Totally. And I thought that was very powerful. <laughs> I believe it was Henry Ford who maybe stole this from Socrates. Whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're probably right. Exactly. you both are equally true. So for those watching or listening and they want to talk to you, 
what's the best way for them to reach out and, and how does it work? What are the first steps? So I live on social media, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, mostly I would say Instagram and LinkedIn. I have a very simple, I don't even know what you call it. See how how good I am at social media. <laughs> the the name, the <laughs> handle. Handle. Um, handle. There we go. No stress DDS. Mm. It's very simple. Love no that. N-O stress, S-T-R-E-S-S, DDS, our title. No stress DDS. And if you go on my Instagram, same thing for Facebook. There's some information how to get in touch with me. I highly, highly recommend everybody listening just to hop on my weekly newsletter. I share so much helpful content, advice, tips, free coaching. It's in my Instagram and LinkedIn, in my account, under the bio. I don't know if you know, guys, what bio is. It's under the picture. There's a little link. Just click there. It says free newsletter. So I'll get that. Or if somebody who has been around personal help, personal development, and sees the value of coaching or wants to learn more, um, I recommend a free 60-minute consultation with me. I usually help people create that vision, set these goals. Like me and Luke, we talked about a little bit how people don't even know where they're heading. That's where I help them do during that one hour consultation call. Where I really help them go deeper and decide, hey, when do you want to retire? Do you need an associate? Uh, are we going to eventually let them buy or are we just going to close the shop? Or like, what's our exit strategy? How many days do we want to work? Do we want to have kids? Do we want to, what's our retirement strategy and things like that? So that's usually what I do on that completely complimentary one hour consultation call. And all could be found in, in my bio on Instagram. And on LinkedIn, it's just my name, Dr. Jana Konovalenko. Those are the best ways to find me. Amazing. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks so much for coming on the Grow Ortho podcast. Likewise. Thank you so much for having me, Luke. If you enjoyed this video, check this one out on how to improve your new patient calls.